Okay, welcome everybody. Hello. Thank you for coming along and uh, welcome. We've been through a few talks already today. Um, so I'm really excited to be sharing some ideas with you. Uh, I've been thinking about since pretty much the last conference, I think as soon as I finished that one, I've been planning this talk, hence the reason it's got nothing to do with the digital age. But it's okay. Um, <laughs> you're probably sick of it right now, by now, right? So, um, it's a little intro picture, it's to warm your hearts. There's the next generation of Owens there. Um, it's, uh, yes, coming along nicely in uh, June and August. Um, it's got the same profile. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <It's not> <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Richard Owen. Um, we don't have a name for the baby yet. Um, my type preferences are INTJ, so hence I'm a dominant introverted intuitive, which makes me fascinated about the topic of this talk, um, as, it's, as it's something that I'm, I'm very much drawn to a lot of the time. And I've been thinking about the definitions of it, um, and you'll see as we go along how I've, I've kind of developed my view on what it is. Um, so I've got an MSc in organisational psychology I did a few years ago, after transitioning from a career in music originally, um, and previous to that, chemistry. So I've a very wide background of things. Um, uh, my new website is coachingsolution.co.uk, it's my executive coaching thing, so I'm called by coach as well. Uh, personalityparts.com is my new model. It's not just an extension of type, it's completely starting from the grounds up model of the mind and personality, but type fits into it. Um, I'm MBTI certified, and I'm the current BAPT treasurer. Come to the AGM, and I'll read the accounts to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really selling it, am I? Um, and there'll be wine. And there'll be wine, yes. <laughs> there'll be wine. Uh, ease the pain. And, and then we've got um, yeah, John Beebe, um, amazing guy who's like a mentor of mine, um, and who has created the, the model you've no doubt been hearing about all weekend, the archetypes and the eight functions. Um, and that's something I've taken as a, as a bit of a speciality. And it's also called depth typology because he really brings in ideas from his work as a Jungian analyst, as, as a psychotherapist with type. Um, originally, I'm from Newcastle, currently in London, going to Brighton. See a pattern? <laughs> Moving south. Okay. Okay. So, what your, rela <laughs> your relationship to NI introverted intuition? Presumably, you know your type. So, put your hands up if it's your dominant function. You. Auxiliary function, that's ENTJs and ENFJs. Who are the back? Okay, interesting. You found a table together. Um, <laughs> tertiary, ISTPs and ISFPs. Silence, yes. Interesting, isn't it? Inferior function? In the shadow, the rest of you. Oh, that's quite a lot. <laughs> wow, okay. Well, I'm sorry if you develop a negative emotional reaction towards me, and in the, or if I melt your brain throughout this talk, because... You know, I'm going to be using, as I do, my introvert's intuition quite a lot, and so calling you to do the same thing. So apologies if it, if it becomes um, taxing on your bandwidth. <laughs> using the buzzwords here from this weekend. Uh, so we're going to talk about you know, one of the eight functions, that, um, known as the function attitudes, because it's the function I, the letter with the E or I attitude. Um, cognitive processes is another name for it, although cognitive psychology, as far as I know, has never actually written about them, it's just a type thing. Um, these are the, the functions paired up in their opposing pairs, as they form dominant and inferior combinations. I believe, it can be contentious, that the only way we actually experience the MBTI preferences, that's IE, SNT, and F, is through these. These are, in my mind, the actual functions of the mind, of experience. That's what we actually do. Um, and, and it's a different perspective, because the, the, the traditional story is that we've got a feeling function, and it comes in two flavours, of introvert and extrovert. And I'm like, well, actually, I don't think it works like that. For me, like the fundamental thing is the function, the function attitudes. And I think that, the, 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 that these sort of whole functions are abstracted from that. And that's why it gets a little bit complex in the descriptions for the MBTI preferences where people will read one line and go, oh, that's really me, and another one they go, oh, that's not quite me, because when you're mixing up introverted thinking and extroverted thinking, for instance, they're very different, extremely different experiences to have and extremely different functions in what they do and how they act on the world. 
Um, so that's just something to get you started on, you know, trying to you know, question our basic assumptions. Um, so, yeah, for instance, yeah, extrovert feeling, introvert feeling, very different functions. All the different ones are different, attitudes are different. Um, and remember that the eight functions were Jung's types. He had an eight type system. He talks about introverted, intuitive types. Um, he doesn't have a 16 type system. It was only in the Myers Briggs system that like, built it into a 16 type system and added, and added the, the auxiliary in there. Although he hinted at the auxiliary, but never really did anything with it. And critically, like myself and John Beebe believe that like, the types of consciousness, or even types of mind, is better because then that opens up to the unconscious as well. They're, they're, they're not just um, they're not types of people, which is what Jung said himself. He didn't want to like label people. They're, they're types which we all have. We all have all these types of minds, these eight functions, uh, but we just express them in different ways. I don't expect you to read that. That's, <laughs> that is the literature list. Um, if, if you want to email me after the talk, I can, I can send you a copy of the slide. I'm not going to put them on the website, but for you, for making the effort to attend, I can send you them. That's the books that I've looked and referenced for the material in this talk. I've got an awful lot of stuff to get through. I'm going to throw tons of information at you. So what I want to do is I want to create like a definitional space for introvert intuition. There's so many people written about it. I've, I've been looking at 100 years, pretty much, of literature, although there was a quite a big gap after Jung, about 100 years of literature on introverted intuition, trying to get my head around what exactly it is, because um, it's so mysterious. Um, I've got about one minute slide, I can do this in 30 minutes, I've, tried, I've worked this out, if I've got one minute slide, I can get through the whole lot. Now this might be overload information, so what I don't want you to do is like concentrate too hard and try and analyse every word. I'm going to read it, and I'd like you to just let it wash over you, absorb the general stuff about introvert intuition, and let your intuition connect the dots, and let it be cut, and you'll get a general sense like that you have a picture of what introvert intuition is from all this information thrown. Just don't try too hard. Just let your let your mind take it in. Okay. So Jung, <laughs> Jung said. Uh, Introvert intuitive types, because he was dealing with people who were habitually drawn to using pretty much one function at the exclusion of all the others, because they generally ended up. In, in, he was working as a psychiatrist. Remember that. So, mystical dreamer and seer on the one hand, and for the fantastical crank and artist on the other. Uh, it's a consciousness that peers behind the scenes, quickly perceiving the inner image. And he gives an example of this. So, a man with a case of psychogenic vertigo. That's vertigo, you can see he's wobbly on his feet and he can't, um, and it's caused by something psychological. He sees the image of a tottering man pierced through the heart by an arrow. And in that mind, his mind is the, it's the cause. There's something psychological which is represented to him by his intuition, by this image of the man with the, the, the thing through his heart. And that's, the, that's an experience of intro, intro, introvert intuition. The images appear as though detached from the subject, as though existing in themselves without any relation to him. These images represent possible views of the world which may give life a new potential. And he goes on. The, the extraordinary aloofness of the individual, thanks you all. But well, he was him too, wasn't it? So that's all right. Um, aloofness of the individual from tangible reality. I will take this personally, by the way. But yeah, this negative stuff. Aloofness of the individual from intangible reality, down material world. Um, he may even become a complete enigma to his immediate circle. If not an artist, he's frequently a misunderstood genius, a great man gone wrong, a sort of wise simpleton. That's your service. <laughs> a figure for psychological novels. Um, I want some commission. <laughs> Introverted intuition is directed to the inner object, a term that might just, justly be applied to the contents of the unconscious. The relation of, the inner, to, of inner objects to consciousness is entirely an analogous to that of outer objects, through, though the reality is not physical but psychic. So he's saying, you know, we've got kind of boundary of the self, and out there's the, the physical objects, and in there is the psychological objects, and we're relating to them. It perceives all the background processes of consciousness with almost the same distinctness as extroverted sensation registered external objects. And it does not concern itself with external possibilities, but with what the external object has released within him, the subjective factor. It's a very personal thing as well. The introverted intuitive moves from image to image, chasing after every possibility in the teeming womb of the unconscious, without establishing any connection between them and himself. 
as extroverted intuition does with the external possibility. So as much as the extroverted intuitive is chasing the possibilities out there, we're chasing the possibilities in here. Um, this function which the outside world is the strangest of all, introverted intuition apprehends the images arising from the a priori inherited foundations of the collective, collective unconscious. I mean, this is where some people go, whoa, collective unconscious, that's all crazy. Um, I mean, he goes on to, to explain a bit more about what this is, and this, this will show you how this leads me into why I've brought in the idea of memory in this. Uh, so, in the collective unconscious, these are archetypes whose innermost nature is inaccessible to experience, are the precipitate of psychic functioning of the whole ancestral line. The accumulated experiences of organic life in general, a million times repeated and condensed into types, and I've put in brackets, evolutionary memory. Think about it, you're talking about something that's built up, like not just this through the, our human evolution, but even before that, it's like talking about ways of being and patterns that are actually kind of just innately built in and carried all the way through this process. It's prophetic foresight and explained by its relation to the archetypes which represent the laws governing the course of all experienceable things. This idea of an archetype is like some energetic template of some kind which has the ability to uh, influence the form of the world that we know. Does that make sense? Who's frowning? <laughs> oh, frowning. You've been my frownometer, you can like let me know. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when our eyebrow goes too high, I'm going to know that I've gone too far. Okay, so this is an interesting thing. That was Jung. That was, some, that was the best nuggets I could draw out of Jung's stuff. I uh, was looking through his whole collected works. So he didn't really talk about introvert, the types a lot in his later career. He kind of wrote the book and go, well, I've done with that. I'm going to move on. But I like, referenced it in some lectures and things. He did use it in his work, actually. But, I mean, he just didn't write more books about it. Um, so, Natalie Pillars, we're just going to jump rather than... So we were in the 1920s just before. In, in, in our flapper dresses and whatever, and, and now we're jumping to the modern day, where Natalie Pillard, who's uh, a Jungian scholar, has recently written a book called Jungian Intuition, so I had to read that. Um, and he's, so she's saying, like, Jung was misinterpreted by a lot of the translators. And bear in mind, he wrote in German, um, and in like a lot of languages, it, German has words that don't exist in English, really. They have to be translated by more than one word, and translators were keeping it simple, would use the closest word they had, to mean what they thought he was saying. And it didn't really capture it. And she was looking back and going, well, it wasn't quite what he meant. And actually, us in the, in the English-speaking world have not really quite grasped some of the concepts that Jung really meant us to understand in his, in, in his talk about intuition. And also some of the translators were biased in the way that they approached it. So they had a certain, um, <coughs> certain mindset in how they saw things, and therefore they sort of took more of that out of his writing and emphasized it. So another, an idea that we don't really come across that we've probably never heard of is the underconscious. We've talked talk about the unconscious and the conscious. The underconscious, it's like, like the subconscious, it's kind of between. And he talks about like, you know, this is in between consciousness and unconsciousness and it favors the appearance of intuition. Now those who are dominant introverted intuition um, types will know what I mean, right? It's the un underconscious is just that like, fuzzy place where you go just before kind of something pops out and you get a light little insight. It's that kind of place where you're receptive to that coming out, but you're kind of disengaged. Um, now, this word here, a bit hard to pronounce, it's actually an shawung. An shawung means to look into and to see the collective myth. This, this, the, the an shawung was something that like, Jung wrote about quite a lot. Um, it's, it's this kind of thing that brings the, the nature of the archetype out, makes the archetype visible or understandable or perceivable. It's kind of what introverted intuition does. It sees into the, uh, the collective myth, as he calls it. Einfall. Uh, Einfall. It's something that falls into your head from nowhere. You know, that's a really cool word. I don't think we've not really got a word for that in English, have we? Directly? No. I might call it a hunch or something. I think that's what it is all sometimes interpreted as. Okay. Or Einfall. Okay. A light bulb moment, isn't it? Yeah, but it comes from nowhere. So it's like, wow, where's that? Yeah. And, and he sees also intuition really tied in with em empathy. Like, participation, partial mystique is what he's seeing as um, 
the sort of internal processes of our, our, our workings of our minds, but projected into the outside world and identifying them as if they're really out there when they're, really, when they're actually in here. Transference, which happens within his practice as a, as a, as a therapist, there was, there was an aspect of intuition in that. Um, and synchronicity, another like, massive concept of Jung's, was really tied in with intuition. Yeah? So it's very central to a lot of what Jung's work was about. Um, so I'm going to go into some other ones. So, so it jumps all the way from there, from the 20s, and then it picks up. Like People start writing about the eight functions more again, like in the 80s, when I think well, there was a bit more of like a, a massive increase of MBTI stuff around the world, wasn't there? At that point, if you look at the statistics, the numbers for APTI and stuff, that was when it was booming. It was like absolutely like thousands and thousands of people. So this guy, Darrell Sharp, writes a book there. So he's, I'm going to whiz through some of these contents of the unconscious, what the external object has released within, smelling out the future, like mystical daydreamers, seers and prophets, poets, artists, among primitive peoples, they're the shamans who convey the messages of the gods to the tribe. Uh, the Hartzlers and, and Bob McAlpine in 1993 saying like synthesizing information, identifying deeper or ultimate meaning of symbol that's in what's represented. The meaning behind what is, the sixth sense. It's not defined by past, present, or future, but as an unconscious flow of perception into consciousness. Flashes of insight, head in the clouds, seeing beyond the physical world. The flash of the future occurs only when ready. Read between the lines and search for the deeper meaning. We focus on symbols, signs and meanings rather than concrete information, often has to search for what produced the insight if required to support and defend it. Disengage to focus on internal thoughts and ideas, expands the scope of the problem to its fullest limits, searching for the essence, determines the vision of change, where do I and we want to be? Keep going. Uses the objective situation in the interest of the inner understanding, the subjective understanding of the objective situation. Searching out new angles for viewing and understanding life, it's creative. The interpretation of life and the promotion of understanding. That's the most that I got out of Gifts Differing, um, Isabel Myers. Myers. So this guy, I like this guy, um, Vic Thompson, INTJ, nice fellow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he's got a really good little book, it's really small, it's about the eight functions, it's fantastic. You know, his take on these was like kind of, when you're looking at what had happened before, it was kind of another step forward in really getting to grips with the eight functions and, and seeking what, out what they mean. As, intuit uh, as intuiting perceives the unconscious manifestation of images, relationships and concepts, it stores them in a symbolic memory for later retrieval. So my, then my like, looking for clues thing was, aha, memory again. You know, we've got this thing about the collective unconscious and this kind of idea of memory, and then we've got this, this Dick Thompson re referring to it. So it makes me curious. Unfortunately, much of the steady stream of images going into symbolic memory does not make it into permanent storage or into a retrievable area. Consequently, many of the NI's best images are lost. Anyone experienced that? Yeah. Another problem with NI's contribution to memory is that the data may be of such an abstract form that it has to be modified to be retrieved, resulting in a loss of meaning. This may lead to the memory of an event coinciding with objective reality. And what I think is like, you know, if this, it's such an abstract type of memory that I think when we see these symbols and things, the symbols are usually concrete things, objects that we know, but also share that kind of similar quality to the thing that we're, the, the, the intuition that we're having. And I'm starting to think that when we're getting some did anyone get that? Like, vision, like, see an actual metaphorical sort of image that represents something. And I don't mean just in dreams, but even sometimes daily. And some people are nodding. Some people are going, what are you talking about? This is mad. Mm -hmm. You know, but you know, it's, it's the private world of the mind. We don't talk about this stuff. These people would think you're bonkers. But it's like, it's true. You know, people get it. See a, an image or a symbol or some kind of, it means something. And for me, that's when it's actually coupling to, like, to introverted sensing. And we're getting something that we know from the tangible world. And, we're, and it, it's, it's representing the the intangible nature that we're trying to be aware of. Um, more from Thompson, virtuality is not, not as great as the idea, I think, but it's a world of this indescribable images and potentialities where everything is possible. And the most, even the most bizarre and paradoxical combinations. Paradox, really important part of this. And I think some images and metaphors difficult to articulate. 
An example is like Kekulé's snakes. This Kekulé was a chemist. He discovered the benzene molecule in a dream. He saw a snake which curled around and ate its own tail. It joined round to make a ring, which is what benzene's like, right? According to chemistry. Images might not make sense or seem bizarre to the non-NI. NIs are, they sort of like the type together. And we're, inter we're interspersing between the type and the function because people kind of often define their function by the type, i.e. the person who is drawn into that all the time. NIs are amalgamated with the future, uncanny ability to see the future, often prophets, seers, artists, or visionaries. Often their work is so complex or ahead of its time that it's not understood until examined by later generations. That's sad, isn't it? <laughs> so this is a different Thompson without a P, this is Lenore Thompson. Acknowledge many conceptual standpoints, solving a problem by shifting their perspective and defining the situation some other way. Never satisfied with what they know. Real effort to make use of the knowledge that they already have. The everlasting dance, that's a beautiful thing. Like the everlasting, it's, it's talking about something sort of energetic and form, formational that's like around, like in, in the world around us that we can perceive with introverted intuition that he calls the everlasting dance. Nice. The reality that lies behind reality. And we'll get more to it in a minute why that's actually probably a really good way to look at it. Prophets, poets, and heretics. I'd like to be one of them. The sense that truth is a core experience, archetypal, impossible to express, in a way that captures its full significance. Anyone ever feel like that? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Depressing. Yeah. Um, okay, so we went like Linda Behrens and uh, Dario Nardi, who's at the conference here. So they wrote some great books together. Um, they tend to be inter integrative. They quickly grasp the interrelatedness of everything in their universe. Over time, I've built a worldview like constructing a map of the cosmos. And from this, essentially, everything is understandable and anything is possible. It doesn't mean an actual map of the cosmos, of the planets and the stars. It's a metaphor. <laughs> Don't take it too literally. So, foreseeing implications and likely effects without external data, realizing what will be, conceptualizing new ways of seeing things, Envisaging transformations, getting image or profound meaning or far reaching symbols, synthesizing the seemingly paradoxical or contradictory. Again, this is something about this kind of level of like above opposites and things that conflict. It's like getting a sort of perspective above that. Realizations come to us, it's the einfall again. A disengagement from interactions in the room occurs. Sorry. Um, <laughs> followed by a sudden aha, or that's it, predict, enlighten or transform, laying out how the future will unfold based on unseen trends and telling signs. It's what the ancient Chinese used to call, um, like, reading the seeds in the situation. That's, that's what they call that. It's like, there's, there's some, something there, clues or how things happen, that means you can kind of predict what's going to happen next. Concept, universal, transcending ex experiences, or solutions and certainty, flashes of insight that present themselves as very broad themes, describing implications and the final picture. Uh, Naomi Quaint, who's read any, any of her stuff? She does, uh, yeah, great stuff. What's that really mean? That's an amazing. It's like she's kind of, kind of sort of created the whole grip thing, I guess, really, and like made that an actual thing in in in, in the type world. And wrote, you know, really honed in on what it was to be gripped by the inferior function. Um, so ideas and possibilities at conceptual level, and to focus on the essence of those ideas that are certain, and in, inner interconnected possibilities. And this is where she's great. She says, as, as dominant function, intellectual clarity, accurate interpretation or perceptions, visionary insight. But, but, as an inferior function, internal confusion inappropriate attribution of meaning and grandiose vision. So you're seeing the two sides, like when it's, when it's done right and when it's done wrong, too, too much or whatever. It's innovative, unusual perspective, spiritual, sometimes mystical. Um, so the Hartzlers, um, a lovely couple who were like, you know, a tight couple, and I don't know if they're still around, but they, yeah, they were very old even a few years ago, I remember. But, they're still alive. They're still alive. Great. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Amazing books as well. You've got to get 2005. This book about the eight functions, like one of my absolute favourites about the eight functions. Um, I think it's called Functions of Type. 
as well. They put it in quite a few books. That's the particular one that I've got, but I know they've got a few. This was in 2005, they wrote that. Insights into the unknowable, how things ultimately will be, how individual ideas and objects fit into the overall scheme of existence. An awareness of abstract ideas, images, and conceptualizations. Resolve these ideas and symbol, images into symbols. We've all got the idea of what a symbol is now. We've got some, I always thought for years, this is kind of some weird idea. Symbol, what do they mean by symbol? Yeah, some kind of like metaphorical image that you to kind of visualize. Patterns and connections. <laughs> Several perspectives at the same time, attaches subjective meaning to these perspectives, and then resolves these multiple perspectives to get the truest perspective, if that is a thing. Have insights that seem to appear from thin air. Waits patiently. Do you see this idea of einfall, kind of like everyone's going to follow it through, but they never had the word for it really. Um, waits patiently until the competing images crystallize into an integrating perception, probably at some meta level of understanding, based on a broader level. And this, this word meta, I think it's the first time this has cropped up. That's really important. Um, the meaning behind presented material. Then Dario, Dario comes along, like with his brain scanning device. Anyone have that done? You get that? I thought he was going to inject my brain with jelly at one point. Is that the syringe? And it's, like, it's not. It's just to like like help the electrodes contact on your skin. It gets in your hair. It's a bit like hair gel. You get a new style from it as well. Just transforming with a meta perspective. So a perspective above other perspectives that kind of takes in the, the perspectives. Receive an insight or realization. Enter a very brief trance to answer answer problems. And this is the underconscious again, yeah. This is that place where introvert intuition like, sucks you in. You're like, and my wife's smiling because she knows <laughs> when I'm in that place and I'm in the underconscious. Like, like hello, I'm talking to you, and like, sorry, I'm in the underconscious. So I'm in a trance. Um, draw upon the whole brain to answer a novel problem. So, because Dario is a neuroscientist, he starts seeing what's actually going on in the brain when people are introvertedly intuitive. A whole brain zen like pattern. All regions of the neocortex, that's the outer layer of the brain that evolved more recently, are in sync. They're firing together at the same frequency and dominated by brain waves that are medium to low frequency and very high amplitude. So there's a lot of energy there, but they're like kind of low, low wave, low, low frequency, sorry. They're not the spread out waves. Um, typically, if someone, these, these sort of waves are typical of someone being awake yet relaxed. And, and he sees a solid blue EEG, which is the machine that he uses, which kind of visualizes this, which segments of the brain are firing. Um, so the solid blue EEG for any type, you can see this solid blue whole brain pattern for any type who's using their specific expertise, right? So Zen state, it's like a flow, it's the flow state, right? We all have a flow state, often it's when we're doing different kinds of activities. Um, but, the interest, the differences for NI types show for unfamiliar, novel problems. That's which is totally the opposite way around. So you give an INTJ or an INFJ a, a problem to solve, which they've never seen before, uh, and their brain kicks into gear and goes, and this kind of like, this whole brain thing kicks in and they like, tries to solve the problem. So it's very interesting. Um, I'm yet to get the results actually. I'll wait till he emails me, but I'll, I'll share them next time. You can see my, my brain in, like doing its thing. Zen state might occur in a jiffy or hold for the duration of a task, or it might manifest, manifest later when the person returns to the problem. And the Zen state works best when focusing on a single question without distractions. You really need to get in the zone, right, to do your introverted intuiting. It has to be the right environment. It may easily show, an NA text may easily show a Zen state when tasked to envision the future. It's about holistic problem solving. NI types are generalists, not specialists and experience a premonition or foresee the unexpected, gain a profound realization from a mystical state or catharsis, synthesize a new idea that transcends various opposing points of view, expansion of awareness, definitive insight, synergy when the perspective is greater than the sum of the old one, which is again like the, the meta perspective. And you use the word perspective with qualifiers like higher, broader, global, or another term. Anyone heard of that? An I type say that? It's a higher perspective. It's a global, broader, holistic. Any other ones? Gestalt. Gestalt, yeah, any other thing. Yeah, it's true. Um, so, Mark Huntiger, um, is it Leone? 
Mark Yeah, Mark Hunziker and Leona Haas. They wrote a book together. Now, Mark Hunziker is an uh, INTJ by preference, right? And he, so he's, again, like Dick Thompson, got this kind of like the inner, inner, inner track to it. Focus on the subject of in a world of the unconscious to find intangible connections and abstract relationships between the contents of the unconscious and or the environment. He wants to discover underlying significance, systems and meaning, such as the grand patterns, themes and systems in order to understand the meaning and significance of everything. There's something like this everythingness, this, this like, it doesn't stop at the problem, you know, it wants to connect to everything. It seeks to understand through an abstract sense of the essential nature of all things and their complex interrelationships. Again, the entire dance of the universe, which we saw before. Um, understanding the universal truths that the tangible objects represent behind the curtain. So yes, think about this, the tangible physical world that we all experience, and there's this behind the curtain world. More about that in a bit. Understand everything at once as an interconnected whole. Inspiration is the driver, the energizer, and the goal. They're carrying on a search for meaning, a search for the cosmic significance and for the underlying commonalities of all that we see. It's true. Um, very frustrated and impatient. When others cannot see what I see, People who dispute their predictions simply lack the vision to be able to see what's coming. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, Susan Nash called it visioning. That was her name for the function, and I. Unconscious correlation of conceptual ideas, possibilities and symbols that enter consciousness, a whole system or idea. Needs time to incubate before the idea is clear. Associated with our hearts and shower solutions. I love that. Anyone gets, like they call it in the shower, like you kind of get, ah, aha, the meaning of life. Now, well, where's the shampoo? It's like, you know, really is like a, you know, often it's something that is kind of distracting you from, like, it with, with some sort of mundane task. Um, and then you, like, just out of nowhere, like, would you like to? I wasn't going to share a shower solution, but um, noticing this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, like yeah. In, in a way, they, they talk about the inferior function opening the doorway to the un unconscious, and the intuitive function is like so linked to the unconscious. So that would make sense, right? It's like, and it needs to get in there. Um, the future, what will be? And I just know. There's another great phrase there. You know? How do you know? Just know. I don't know. You just do. And that's the sense you get from introverted intuition. Um, Ah, there she is, Marky Reed. Great books. Have you got any for sale? Excellent. Get them quick before they run out. Now everybody knows. Um, there's two of them, right? Yeah. 2014 and 2017. Yeah, I've got both of them. Really good. Um, so, um, meanings, hunches, and insights. This isn't everything she wrote, by the way. This is just some nuggets that I pulled out. And I've kind of, as I've gone on, I've like sort of not put in things that other people have put before. I've tried to put in things which were slightly different. Meanings, hunches, and insights, forecasting, forecasting outcomes with little data, seeking meaning, symbolizing, underlying patterns, seeing beyond physical evidence, and reading the intangible for proof of knowing, receiving insights, distant future orientation. That's the, that was the first time I, I've been anyone that sort of looked at our future, but then distant future. So that was interesting. And for me, like, I'd even expand it. So it's almost like a, it's almost like beyond time. I think in some ways, it's like a timelessness that you're looking for. This sort of patterns that have always kind of been there. So it's really interesting. Um, grand plans that reach five to ten years into the future. Strategic planners, crux of issues, voicing the universal universalizable themes. I hate Z. I'm English. <laughs> Threw me there. Okay, <laughs> intellectual clarity, enjoying ambiguity. ambiguity. Um, waiting to be inspired, disguised as chores. So that's what we're talking about here. Like something as mundane as having a shower, washing the dishes, anything that's like kind of absorbing your extroverted sensing. You know, it, you know, kind of creates that fertile underconscious place where it might arise from. Theories of the nature of environments. Don't worry, I'm nearly done with this bit. Um, organizations and people, a universalizable context, not bound by our world's specifics and facts, 
present ideas as intact theories, sometimes seen as too theoretical, not practical, sorry, general ideas and principles that are central to their philosophy of life or compelling vision of self, attracted to visionary roles and consider future implications, um, Daydreaming, this is Mark Hunziger in his uh, Depth Typology book. Daydreaming, it's about knowing what's going on behind the scenes, divining obscure truths, search for meaning, significance and patterns, correlations and interrelationships, even if they cannot be proven or demonstrated. The broadest possible implications. And then John Beebe in 2016, uh, he, he sort of starts to define it. His introverted thinking is really strong um, as an ENTP, it's his second function. And he's, he really thinks about words carefully, and he's got these three words which he sees sort of define different levels of, of the function in different aspects of the mind. And he calls it imagining, knowing, divining. He's sort of creating his own little, little mini space, like definitional space there. And he says divining has a double meaning, not only seeing what, in what direction the future is bending, also describing the divine purpose hidden in the developing situation. I think by divine there, it's kind of, you can read that as like energetic, it doesn't have to be a religious thing. Um, big picture in the unconscious, where the gestalts that move nations, religions, and epochs are like, becomes directly aware of the archetype as an image, as if seeing it, responsible for visionary experience, mystical, of all like kinds of consciousness, NI is the one that is most consistently devalued in contemporary Western culture. Any NI types feel that? Yeah. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Just don't get us, do they? Yeah. So I think, yeah, we're basically there now. Give yourself a round of applause to get through it. <laughs> I mean, there may be other writings about NI and, and things, but I, you know, that's a pretty good selection of books. That's like, like the last hundred years of, of stuff. There's, there is a massive gap there. Um, because I guess people weren't really writing about it that much. Um, so do you, give me a quick idea, what do you get from that? What's, what's your intuitive, like, if you can just sum up what you've just absorbed about introvert intuition, what's, what's, what pops up? Heavens. Heavens. <laughs> Would you like heavens? <laughs> no, I'm still, I'm just getting started. It's exhausting. Yeah, it is, isn't it? But the point is, you can't actually say what you've picked up because it's inarticulatable. Yeah. That's yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. We keep having these brilliant ideas that are so clear, <laughs> and then we say, "Wait till I explain this to you," and then you go blah 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 blah, and they look blank, and you think, "I didn't explain mm -hmm. that." And Does anyone ever have an unvoiceable sense of what it is? It's almost as if it's because it seems like introverted sensing. It's almost as if it's connecting data from the current environment from this evolutionary. Mm, yeah, mm. seeing the patterns that, that have kind of been there from mm. before, yeah. And I believe it's not just, personally, I believe it's not just like evolutionary, it's personal memory during our lifetime as well. Um, the thing is like, you know, we all know that your introvert intuition gets better the more you experience. Your intuitions get sharper and more accurate, right? Because when you're a young introverted intuitive, but you're still consistently drawn to make these global assessments of the world, they can be sometimes quite far out and not actually very in touch with what's really going on. And that's quite depressed, like frustrating for an introverted intuitive because we, we really do have crazy ideas. But as we go through life, hopefully if we absorb more and more, we'll see and experience all the, the, the patterns within the world around us and therefore build in that memory within our lifetime. I think that because, it's, as Beauty says here, it's one of the most, um, you know, consciously devalued in our contemporary Western culture. Mm -hmm. I think particularly for children, mm -hmm. um, they, their parents, you know, tell them to keep your feet on the ground and get realistic and stop dreaming and, you know, those sort of messages that often have, unfortunately for some, I think, start to not know if they should trust that in term introvert intuition. Um, but as they get older, they sort of prove the, themselves right. That yes, I was right all along, I just didn't have enough experience to know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Which is also that it's, pu it, it's only pure when it's unexpressed because mm -hmm. whether it, you know, uh, there's no words to yeah. properly explain, no image, no, no, no way basically to describe it. So 
So this purest form here, and the, the moment you try to plot it out, mm. it's it loses its value also because it's impossible to really explain it in its Yeah, that's way. what I mean. The only way we can kind of become aware of it is by coupling with introverted sensation and seeing a concrete object in its place, or mm. coupling with thinking and using words to describe it, or coupling with feeling and, and, and getting a more of an embodied sense of what it is. But they're all mm. limiting by definition. They, they, you can never quite find a way to describe exactly mm. what's going on in there. Yeah, doesn't stop us trying though, does it? Mm. <laughs> is, it, is, it your mind, is it your mind trying to organise abstract concepts, but you're not really aware of it on the surface? It's bubbling along. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I mean, it's, so it's an organisation process. Right? I guess so. You can you can be you can be kind of aware of it, but like yeah, not in a very concrete way that's easily shareable. And that's the thing. Like, I I know things, but I don't know how I know or why I know, but I just know them. And there's something in translating that to other people that kind of is it's frustrating. Kind of loses some of it. Yeah, sorry, Mark. One of the images that I like about it is, is um, there's all kinds of buckets. So I, I've introverted intuition is my auxiliary. I have all kinds of buckets in my head for information. I don't even know some of them exist until something drops in. Then two to six bits have dropped in, and, and a crystal starts to form. It's an idea, it's a theory. And then there's one critical piece that comes in, and it snaps into. Mm -hmm. It snaps right in for me. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time I'm even aware that I was collecting that information and that I was forming a theory about it. Mm -hmm. And when I say it for the first time to somebody else, I know I'm saying it for the first time, but they think it's something I've, I've worked out. And I'm very aware it's the first time I've heard myself mm -hmm. say it out loud. Um, and that's usually the, the starting of a new investigation for me. Like, oh. Oh, there's so, oh, there, there's something there. I'm going to find out more, which is sort of why you know at the end of last year you thought <laughs> I have an I have a, a crystallized idea, yeah. and now I'm going to follow through on it. Yeah. And now we're here, and now you're. Yeah, I had to trace backwards to get the information to support the idea, yeah. even though I'd seen the information before, but I wasn't really consciously aware of it. Yeah, that's that's the frustrating mm -hmm. part. You have to often go backwards in time to, to dig into how you got there to be able to stand on, up here and go, "This is my idea." Otherwise, it just seems to come out of nowhere, and people don't like that. So, but the outcome of your introverted intuition is clear. To me, it is. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, yeah. It's just um, is it that people don't like it, um, rather than they don't understand the depth of it? You know, it's. it's well, I mean, why do we like things or not like things? I think there's some sort of like. Just emotional reaction, like it's, it's, if you think even in terms of like you know what BB talks about, like the the, the archetypes, like emotional tone complexes, i.e., they bring out an emotional reaction in it. So like you know, if it's say if it's your shadow, a shadow function for you, and someone uses it, you're always going to feel some kind of aversion to it somehow. Mm. But, um, but is that how it is that how it feels? So this this desperate need to as you described go back. Mm. In order to justify or explain or yeah. you know prop up what you know already, but why do we need to do that? You know, because in our society, like it's, it's epistemology, we've got certain ways of that established ways that we know what is true is true, and there's lots of ways to know what is true is true. It's just we've chosen certain ones and go that's the way it is in our society, and therefore you have to go with that. And it's not the introverted intuition way. It's not. Was it inductive or deductive? It's like inductive thinking. It's like what introverted intuition does. That was that the right way around. But we're a deductive mm -hmm. mindset mm -hmm. world. So, so the, the, the question yes. I was is, I think I think what I was asking is, are we sure that's coming from the outside? Or is it coming from in me? Yeah, that's what I was. Ah, am I projecting my hate onto the world? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Probably a bit of both. It's true. I put my hand up. It's true. Um, yeah, but I, I do. Yeah, well, I, I guess I guess I, sometimes I, I, you know, I say to myself like, yes, the, the world's against me, it doesn't understand me. But then some other times, you know, I'll, I'll question that. I'll go, yeah, where's the evidence for that? You know, like. Uh, but then I just go sit in a room full of like lots of NTJs and, and like, am I fooling myself? Uh, two, two things quickly. One, one is uh, for me, it's a, it's a kind of a INTJ. Mm. Uh, there's something about the ability to live with multiple paradoxes. Yeah. And not to, uh, introverted intuition allows you to, to live with things that are actually logically incompatible, mm. but they're clearly part of the same thing and could be yeah. introverted intuitive. And we know somehow they're connected. And that's yes. it. And then we have to Even figure out. You can't see or express what that connection is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very counterintuitive for our particular 
tones of um, you know, Western culture. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is just an image that quite often makes sense to me, which is a, a bit like in a, um, if you're focusing a camera and every, everything is there, but it's blurry, and then you suddenly find the moment where it comes into focus. Yeah, I like uh, it, yeah. And it was always there, but mm -hmm. suddenly you can mm -hmm. see it. Yeah, and great. It's crystal clear. And it's absolutely crystal clear. Yeah. And you think, oh yeah, of course, that's what it was all the time. It's like autofocus when it suddenly snaps in. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you've got it. You've got the picture. So memory, well, obviously, you know, I can't talk about memory without actually looking at well, what does the rest of the psychology mainstream world think? Because we're kind of getting our own little niche in the type world. And uh, you know, there's a lot of psychologists here, there's chartered psychologists here. We've got, um, you know, I'm an organizational psychologist. Um, it's important, to, I think, to bridge that gap and start thinking about concepts from because it's the same reality, it's the same mind that we're exploring, but it's surely like got to map across. There's got to be analogies. So I set myself on that task. I looked at my, uh, cognitive psychology. I got a giant textbook on cognitive psychology and said, okay, let's read about memory. So here's my kind of general overview of like cognitive uh, psychology memory. Um, so there's different theories. Um, there's the, the sort of one that's been most prevalent for quite a long time is the memory systems approach. The idea that there's different memory systems that are kind of got different types of memory almost, that, and, and they're sort of separate in the sense that even doing uh, brain studies, someone that they know they're separate systems because somebody that has a problem with one doesn't with the other, and vice versa. It's called double dissociation. It's like uh, that's how they prove it scientifically, but they're separate systems somehow. And then there's another idea that's like component process brain. Rather than sort of memory systems that do specific types of memory, it's like resources, like different processes, like a bit like our cognitive functions in a way, that sort of do slightly different things, and they can all draw together to, to, to do basically the jobs of what the memory systems do. Does that make sense? I'm not going to go into that. This is like, no, there's a different way. So within the memory systems, there's these different types of systems. There's what they call sensory stores which is a very sort of quick thing. So it's, it's immediately when we sense something, information comes in and it's stored for a very limited period of time before it moves on into a different system. Short-term memory, something you all have heard of, right? Which is often uh, sort of subsumed by the, the term working memory. Because working memory also includes this, what's what they call attentional executive. There's a sort of guiding attention part of working memory as well. And that's just sort of the, the desktop that you kind of got immediately that you're working with. And then the long-term memory, which is um, what we're going to talk about mainly. Um, so within long-term memory, there's two different kinds, generally, of memory. There's declarative memory, which is also called explicit, and there's non-declarative memory, which is implicit. And I guess the, the, the basic, the word declare is kind of the clue there, because it's saying, like, declarative is something that you are aware of being aware of. You know that you've got that memory, and you can share it, you can tell somebody about it. Declar it's declarable, declarative. Anything to declare? It's like customs. Um, <laughs> Non-declarative, on the other hand, is like, you know, it's, it's kind of, you could say, kind of unconscious. It's like, you know, you don't know it's there, but it's there. Um, for instance, like, how do you know it's there? So procedural memory and priming, it's, it's things like um, the memory of how to drive your car. You know, how you have you got some, got where you're going or where you're driving, but you're not thinking about the, the, what you're actually doing. You're just doing it. It's procedural memory. You're not aware that you even have it as a memory. You're just doing it, and it's like unconscious. And priming is like when you have, um, so you're exposed to something that then affects your later reactions. It's like in a, Jung used to do it in, a, in his um, word association tests. Like, you know, you sort of say a particular word and measure how long it takes them, someone to react and then give a response. Things have like, leading influences on you, behind the scenes. It draws out things. That's a form of implicit memory. But we, the one we're going to look at mainly is, is as well as declarative explicit memory. Um, that's broken into different types. Episodic memory, that's like facts. What's that film called where there's the balls, the memory store with the kids' cartoon thing? Inside Out? Yeah. Anyone seen that? Yes. Yeah, okay, so that's like depicting like a, a sort of metaphorical store of memory in these little balls which go around these little paths and it's very cool. Yeah, um, so that's like, but you can think of like episodic memory a bit like that, like, like concrete objects, like balls of fact, or if, if something. Um, semantic memory is, is more related to events, I'll talk to you more about that in a minute. 
Autobiographical memory is a bit like episodic memory, it can involve semantic, but it's more about personal experiences. Um, now, when I started reading about this, I started seeing the connections, right? And it was like, oh my goodness, when I'm reading about this, I'm looking for the connections, like same mind, same reality, cognitive psychologists looking at it on one hand, type of people looking at it on the other hand, it's got to be a connection, right? Um, so I, it led me to this hypothesis. Do all of the introverted function attitudes relate to memory? So I came to look at episodic memory. I was like, it's described as specific experiences, especially what and where, and re-experiencing on retrieval. That's something that if you're into like the definition of eight functions, introverted sensing, that's what introvert sensing dominance experience a lot. They re-experience, they go inside and they relive those old memories and, and things that they've experienced. I was like, my God, that's like introverted sensing. It's like specific, concrete memory that you can re-experience. <laughs> Semantic memory is abstracted general knowledge and concepts. But then this is the curious bit. It's about hierarchical categories. And, and when you look at the definitions of like introverted thinking, that's what like introverted thinking does. It, it labels, defines, categorizes things. It always has a way of breaking things down. And I was like, that really relates to that. Hmm. So where are the other ones? Um, also biographical memory has got specific special personal significance and it's persistent it can stay there it can last a lot longer because you've ever had that where something means a lot to you you can remember it easily something that's kind of just whatever can just get discarded and you kind of just don't bother to remember it there's something I've, I've come to think from this is like well does like introverted feeling mediate our memory you know so if we've got a strong value or something like that we care about do we actually remember it more strongly? Interesting. And then there was also this other idea about different, um, they sort of had their own little typology system of their own with like agentic and communal types of autobiographical memory. Agentic agency um, so is about sort of success and achievement. And the other one's communal, relational. Hmm, what dichotomy could that be to do with? Thinking and feeling, yeah. And I was like, well, hang on, you've already used extroverted feeling. And I was like, and agency is, yeah, it's all about extroverted thinking, like going out, grasping the world, making plans. So I was thinking, well, hang on, maybe your other like judging functions also can mediate your memory as well. Yeah, you because know, these agentic types tend to have stronger bi autobiographical memory, which was to do with achievement and goals and purpose. Whereas the communal types were, had stronger autobiographical memory when it was relating to relational, communal stuff. Do you see what I mean? So you, the things that you actually remember more strongly may well be mediated by your values, your decision-making, your judging function. Why would you put BSE, extroverted um, sensing? Interesting, well, I, I don't Isn't that know. where like the, the tennis players, by repeating the movements, they learn as well, and they Maybe, memorize? Yeah. You were talking about the driving the car. Mm -hmm. I, and it's, 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 it could go on, yeah. I mean, you know, everything's got to map across somehow, yes. Uh, my son is an ISP, who is an extroverted sensing. After a specific race or uh, sport event, if you are within, let's say, within the hour after that, you get a full picture of everything that happened. But if you meet him, for example, the day after, it's not so sharp. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a, a very short term episode. There was a famous uh, a Belgian tennis player, uh, Justine Hénard. Just after a match, you would listen to her. She was full of details. And I believe she's an SP. It's interesting. Sporting. It's like sporting is a type of procedural memory. Mm -hmm. You know, it's muscle, me muscle memory, right? That's what they talk about. Um, so, yeah, I guess that, you know, it's got to be in there. So, yeah, everything's got to be in there somewhere, according to my intuition. But I was, uh, Richard, I was more talking about I did this and this happened instead of just yeah. memorizing the gesture. It was really, mm -hmm. this happened to me and this guy did that and reacted this way. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a physical, mm -hmm. the short term. Yeah, and just if you listen to most of the top players, yeah. they can replay a match from three, four years ago. Right. Which strokes they played and when, when fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, how you might f f extra muscle memory, I would think, 
use extroverted sensing. But the introverted sensing of actually remembering which strokes when, yeah. in what circumstances. The gentleman behind me was just what saying his son wouldn't remember. Right. It, so. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, let's talk about it at the bar later. <laughs> <laughs> We've just created a new branch of science. It's only beginning. Okay? Like, so let's not worry about it yet. Um, so the idea is like here, like um, I've got to think that uh, yeah, we look at priming as well. Like there's this thing called conceptual priming, and this, this so, sounds so much like NI. I mean, it brings related ideas to readiness in the mind. For instance, in the world, in the word hat might prime for head. Yeah, because there's some similar link there, right? Head and heart are linked um, as concepts. And start sort of thinking, oh, yeah, well, no, but it certainly sounds like it. No, and I, do you get that? Mm -hmm. Out of the types of memory, like, and I sound, certainly sounds like it's implicit. We've talked about we can't, we can't quite grasp, but we don't quite, can't declare it. Mm. Yeah? Can I, can I just ask a question? Is the term having a sixth sense acceptable to you, or is that sound of a well, like all right. If you're talking about tangible senses like sight, hearing, smell, etc., in any case, we've got more than five because um, we've got uh, interoception, like the, the, your body tells you when you're hungry, thirsty, tired, things like that. That senses. <coughs> it's got your proprioception, where your body knows where it is in relation to other parts of itself. Mm. So there's loads more senses yeah. than five, anyway. It's the eighth size. Mm. Yeah. I've always not liked that when they imply that ni is a sixth sense. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's an over simplification. It's sort of a shortcut to it's this mysterious world that yeah. we don't know about, so we're just going to call it the sixth sense thing. Yeah. 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 Example, I knew Anna was about to walk into the room because I was thinking about her and she walked in just there, took a picture. Mm. Um, and I worked backwards, like you say, I went, how the hell did I know that? And I think I probably heard her boots coming up and know the way she walks. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I mean, as a, as a thing of memory, if, if I have a second, yeah, yeah, because yeah. um, I'm INTJ, and we, we used to work here um, on these development <coughs> centres that used to go on like really late into the night, and they were awful, and it was a job we Anna hated as well. Um, and when it was, we saw um, we were coming up the road, and she went, "Oh God, Kent's Hill, do you remember this place?" And all I could see was darkness and a bowl of chips. I was like, <laughs> well, of course, I don't say I, I don't speak my introverted intuition out loud. I'd be locked up. So I was like, darkness and bowl of chips, what's that? And then, you know, I'm working it through, where the hell's that come from? And it was all about this one particularly bad night, it was my birthday, and we thought, if we can get back to my house in time for the chip van, at least I'll have some sort of birthday, and some evil person here kept us here till 11 o'clock at night, uh -huh. and, and that's formed my whole memory of, so Kent's Hill is now symbolised by darkness and a bowl of chips. <laughs> You've summed up the whole essence of this if that lovely place. Ha yeah, if that helps illustrate what you mean by yeah. an image, a symbol, Something that seemingly un be unrelated. But I actually, I mean, me, me and her, we got lost in here last night. We can't remember the place. <laughs> you see some camera walking around at midnight, yeah. round and round circles. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's no memory for the place or anything. But that's represented your subjective ex like experiencing of this place in one... One in, image. In one, yeah, in an right. image, which even I thought, where's that come from? Yeah. 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 And it's got a, a quality help? of chippy, chippy, whatever it is. Chip in the dark. Chip in the darkness. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, this, um, again, another bit of cognitive psychology, this guy, Conway proposed a knowledge, a knowledge structures model within autobiographical memory. So remember, I've already sort of related, well, autobiographical memory seems to strongly quite relate to personal significance to FI, of episodic memories, which are, as we saw, SI, and the conceptual self consisting of a web of relational links, relational links, NI, from episodic memories to general events, which are arranged in a hierarchy of categories, themes, and theory. So within one like little paragraph, someone in a cognitive psychology book has shown me that, like, yeah, I guess all of the introvert functions can potentially be related to memory. It's interesting. Right, you're doing okay. Ooh. Yes. I've broken myself. Yeah. So, take given all this, where do you think my mind was going? No idea. I have no idea. Good. I do. You want to synthesize it all to create something new? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so I start thinking about quantum physics. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone saw my talk with like. Um, uh, the APCIE chapter last year. Alan was there, he was facilitating it. 
So I did go into this like like the eight functions and like universal physics basically. That was that was my talk. But I've kind of started to hone this down a bit closer to reality now. And um, so you know, when we're talking about this like this behind the curtain world, this this intangible in, 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 intangible connections and things like that. I mean, yeah. On one hand, you know, it starts to sound a bit fluffy and crazy and ungrounded, but actually, you know. This is the problem with psychology. It doesn't cross over into other branches of science enough. And if you start to look at physics, you can look at quantum physics, um, and what was discovered in the 20th century through lots of people, through experiments that were repeatable, through lots of like hard research, that the, na the ultimate thing is that the nature of reality is matter and energy at the same time. Okay? So what and it, this has not been known for that long, really. It's not really fully accepted. And if you think about the world of like energy, what I mean by energy is like waves, fields. Um, waves are actually fields expanding and propagating anyway, but it's the same thing, fields, right? So you know about fields, like magnetic fields, electrical fields, gravitational fields. You get it? Yeah, they're all like, you know, they're all things that we experience every day. Um, but the world is ultimately, like, when you get down to the level of atoms and some tiny, tiny, tiny things, quantum physics realized that, well, actually, the, the, the whole distinction between energy and matter and particles breaks down. Particles, like solid, tangible things that we think are, like, real objects, start to exhibit behaviors that you would expect of waves. And waves start to exhibit behaviors that you would expect of tangible, solid objects. So reality starts to blend and mesh. And because the, the larger world is built out of that tinier world, if you think about it, it follows through that kind of everything is dual nature, wave and particle duality. It's not just, and weirdly, philosophers and intuitives and prophets have been saying this for thousands of years, but they didn't have quantum physics to like say, well, yeah, actually, there is a reality, but it's not some kind of abstract, like, in my, I mean, you know, I, I look at this in a slightly reductionist way, you know, what people might have called spirit, you know, you can relate to energy, fields, waves, the intangible world. And, and, and energy in an intangible sense has, it does shape the world around us. It has a way of becoming, of, of guiding. It's like, why does water go downhill? Why does it always find the lowest point? It's an energetic destiny of that water that it has to, because it's a less energetically less stable place here, and it wants to get that to stay there. Kind of can't stop energy. It forms and shapes the world in a way that follows its own rules because it has to go from there to there. You try going swimming in the sea against the tide, and see what I mean. It's like you know, energy wants to go a certain way, but it's a dual nature. Like the reality is wave and particle duality. It's energy and matter at the same time. Okay, and this is what I've created. This is my name, fancy name for what I call the PPDR hypothesis: psychophysical dualistic reality. It's a very simple logical idea that our mind and brain are part of that reality that is wave and particle duality, and they engage with it. So therefore, surely, they must reflect that reality as well. Even if you're a complete, like, um, what should you call it, like, like Descartes, you know, you think the mind is something completely separate to the rest of the universe and obje objectively observes it as if it isn't part of it, then you would say, well, even if that's the case, it's supposed to engage with the world, and it would have evolved to, to perceive and, and to interact with it on the level which it is, which is dual nature, energy and particles. Okay, you with me? <coughs> Pretty straightforward stuff. <laughs> so the nature of the mind is therefore dualistic. It's a simple, like, logical idea, right? Um, but I've come down to this and said, look, literally, you know, there are rules and principles to how energy and, and waves and fields work, and there's rules and principles to how um, particles and solid, tangible objects work, right? You're all familiar with the physical world, I guess, right? You know how it works. Even if you're not into, like, Newtonian mechanics and you're not an engineer or anything like that, you have an everyday, concrete experience of the tangible world. You know how objects work. If I throw a ball at the floor, it'll hit the ball, floor, and it'll bounce off. It'll do something predictable. It has rules. We know how it works. Yeah. The world of energy and, and waves and fields also has different rules. Physicists and engineers know how that works. They studied it. They use it. They bend it to our will. Wi-Fi. 
think about that. We're disc we're wireless, we're disconnected. Like this energy, like electromagnetic waves have been used to allow us to watch films or look at somebody while we're calling them on a, on a piece of plastic. It's amazing. And yet we don't even we take it like in a, in a pinch of salt, we don't even think about it. But that's using um, the world of energy waves and fields. It's like, well, no, what are the properties of, of waves and fields? How, how do we know what they do that's different to objects and solid stuff? Anybody? They disappear. They do, but yeah. Like they, waves crash on the beach. Well, they, the, they can, the form of it changes. They can dissipate and spread out, right? Because actually that's what fields do, is they, they, they spread. Think about the light that we receive from the sun. The sun's millions of miles away. It's emitting an electromagnetic field, which we can see in the form of visible light and other frequencies as well, coming towards us, expanding in a spherical way from the sun all the way to us. It's incredible. But the waves are traveling, but what they're doing is as they go, they're dispersing, and the energy is getting dispersed over a wider area as it goes. So you're saying it disappears, like the wave spreads out and it kind of crashes and or gets absorbed. What else can waves do? Merge or everything else? Yeah, merging. They can merge, yeah. So unlike objects, but there's boundaries. Is this the thing that, that makes a an object an object? Is it has a boundary? Because boundaries have an interaction and they can like clash each other. But um, waves don't have that. So they can merge and they can form more complex patterns. They can diffract. You know, you can you can split light with a prism. You've all seen that, right? Like Pink Floyd. <laughs> but it's great. Um, you know, so you, you know, we all kind of know about what the rules of that world are. What is it to be in a world that is solid and tangible and physical? What is it to be in a world that is intangible and energetic? And it's these things. That's what I think. It's like you know, I think that sensing thinking engages the world. That part, that side of the duality of, of the world and reality that we're in. They, they operate according to the rules and, and principles of the object, particle, tangible, solid world. And intuition and feeling engage literally with that side of reality, which is just another side of uh, equal side of reality that is there. Everything that is solid has its equal equivalent in the energetic world. This is something you just know, right? I know this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, so how does that look? Okay, um, I'll, just, just a little, I'll, get, I'll get there in a sec. So this, this is interesting that, you know, if you read about the Journal of Consciousness Studies, which is actually an awesome um, journal, it's, um, and this is just one recently from last year, mounting evidence that minds are neural electromagnetic fields interacting with brains. You know, he's talking about, like, this is where con this consciousness science is going. Um, there's lots of different theorists who talked about um, talked about electromagnetic and other wave field theories of, of consciousness and mind. And this idea that you know we've got a brain but along like with the brain it's like the other flip side of it is the energetic side which is I a lot, a lot of people start to believe that is the mind. The mind is this energetic form. But I'm saying what I'm saying is like within the mind you've also got that duality. It's like the duality keeps splitting and splitting. It's like within the one side of it it splits again and it splits again and you've got like the, the intangible side of the intangible of the intangible or the tangible side. You know what I mean? You get what I'm saying? It's awesome. Um, so yeah, so this is where this is where I'm at with it, right? Okay, so perception. The four functions of perception, of Jungian perception. Um, we're here, we're in a room, we're experiencing the reality around us. What I believe is happening first is there's two like dual processes going on. Simultaneously, I think all of our eight functions are simultaneously all working anyway. But in terms of perception, we go there, and what's happening is, uh, think about it in like a, um, a physical sense. So our, there's light hitting objects coming into our senses. The sounds coming out at us. Um, there's things that are coming at us. They're all going to all our sensory organs and creating what? What create gets created? Nerve impulses, yeah. Nerve impulses is data, yeah. It's, it's just impulse, like streams and streams of nerve impulses all coming to our brain, but at some point it's good. It's, so there's got to be some place point at which it interfaces with our mind, and that's where the functions operate at the level of mind. Um, so what's happening is this data is all coming in, a stream of nerve impulses, and extrovert sensing is rendering objects from it. That's all it's doing. 
It's getting a homogeneous stream of, of things, and it's going, there's a thing, there's a thing, there's a thing, there's a thing, there's a thing. It's just rendering objects, it's, it's, you know, it's things. And then we know that something, this is where the start of it goes in the, in the tangible physical world. It can only be an object, it can only be a thing if it has a boundary, right? Makes sense. Once it has a boundary, it's a thing. I love that saying, is that a thing? Is that even a thing? <laughs> yes, it is. Now it is. <laughs> okay, so, but simultaneously, what's happening is we've got another version of reality simultaneously going on, um, which is, doesn't have objects. There's nothing tangible to grasp on it. It doesn't have objects. But reality is nonetheless there. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a field of intangible points. Um, but we, we want to perceive that in field of intangible points. And so what happens is our, um, I believe our extroverted intuition, what it's doing is it's, it's integrating all of those points with every other point. It's going, I want to know what that point is. The only way I can know what it is, because it has no tangible boundary, is by its relationships. Does that make sense? That's the only way I can know, and that's, that's how I can know gravity, right? Okay, if I hold this bottle, there's an intangible point which is the centre of gravity of the Earth. There's an intangible point which is the centre of gravity of the bottle. There's a relationship between them. I can't see gravity, I can't touch it, I can't smell it. But the only way I can know it is through the relationship of something with it, through the bottle with the Earth. And I get a sense, I can start to build up an intuitive map and a sense of what gravity is like. We all have that implicitly, right? We know what gravity is like. And if we got stuck on the moon, we'd suddenly be, whoa, hang on a minute. I didn't even know that I knew what gravity was like till that happened. Um, so I think you've got these two tangible processes. You've got one version of the world where you've got intangible points and extroverted intuition is going, like firing off, connection, connection, connection. Like every point has to be integrated with every other point to know what reality is, to perceive it. And that, and like, that can be extremely tiring and exhausting. Yeah? And what happens as a result of that is possibilities get created. Because when you're integrating everything with everything else, you get lots and lots of combinations and lots of new exciting possibilities. Um, but then you've got a store of, of memories. So I believe that, you know, I love this symbol, like it's like a, a tree, like the trunk, you know, at different stages in the, over time, the tree was a different object. There's a memory of how it was, even still built in there. I love that. You know, and that's a bit, um, you know, we could use the, the, the inside out, like the balls in the, in the storeroom kind of a, a tangible objects because it only it's, it's taking objects and it's storing them and it's re retrieving them and referring back to them and comparing things to them um, it's explicit because you know that objects and, you, and you're aware of them and you can tell them you can declare them you can tell people about it but implicit memory well you've got this suddenly you've got all this um, and you know it looks a bit random and it's just it's just like a they had someone in our house the other day doing a survey and they had this like machine this theodolite thing and it was like just, just automatically scanning the room, like taking all these measurements. I was like, that's a bit like, you know, extroverted intuition. It's going, it's going in there and it's mapping this matrix of all the connections in, in the intangible realm around it. But then that's all getting stored in, into what I'm saying is implicit memory. And you're building up this matrix of, of all the connections you've ever experienced about everything. And the more times you experience something in different contexts, the more connections you've got to that. And, the more, and, and this sort of builds up this, this map, and this sort of, it's, it's cumulative, yeah, over time. So you start to build up this, this map of how things are, which is exactly the sort of stuff that people have been talking about in those quotes we looked at, right? Except now I'm actually relating it to, to physics, I guess, to something that's actually going on in the world around us. Um, so there you have it. You know, so, so what I'm, I'm looking at in terms of the introverted intuition is... Um, Okay, so my definition is this. Um, in a field of intangible points, which is what the energetic non-particle reality is like, yeah? Extroverted intuition perceives the quality of each point from its relationships with every other point. Like I said, doing this kind of like, what's that and that and that. And that's how we know what each point is like, what its nature is, because of its, how it relates. Like the bottle with the earth, yeah? It's the only way I can know the gravity, um, and I can get to know about the bottle, I can get to know about the points that, that it relates to through the relationship as well. Um, and it's integrated with every other point, and 
if you've seen any of Dario Nardi's work, it's like it's a Christmas tree brain pattern. You see like what happens when extroverted intuitions at work, and it's like what's it called? A starburst as well. Starburst. That's his new term. Uh, it's like the, the different segments of the cortex are doing that. They go, they're flashing on and off really fast, and like it's all like this big random pattern. Sounds a bit like what I was, you know, talking about in this kind of, um, you know, it's, it's it's integrating everything. This and this and this and this and this and this. Um, an infinite possibilities result. Um, but what I'm saying is, any stores these qualia, or oh, that's another way of talking about a quality. It's like a subjective experience of that relationship that you've, you've, on what that point is like through its relationships. In implicit memory building a lifetime matrix or model of the world. So what happens then when you go to use introverted intuition? Um, well, actually, no, actually, just before that, the, uh, the underlying archetype is slowly revealed. So what I'm, I'm, this is my own intuition, is that I'm getting to this sort of idea that what's actually underneath it all is actually kind of a branching sort of pattern. Because um, you think about it like, you know, energy does this. You know, where have you seen this kind of thing going on in, in the energetic world? Tree tracks. Trees, yeah, trees do it. What else? In a pure energy sense. Root systems. Root systems. Um, if it was the other way around? What lightning. about light, lightning? Yeah, lightning's a great one because if you see what happens, like, like what lightning does, is, you know, this, it's, a, it's a differentiation of the, of the lightning fork, of the path. It splits and it branches and it branches. There's something innate to branching, I think, this is my own intuition, about what's going on in the world. That, that, that whereby things, I think that's what they meant in the, in the, um, in the definitions about like, that everything's related to everything else. Mm. And I guess if the things, if, if the form of the world we're in was somehow created in a kind of branching way, um, then you would expect everything to relate to everything else. Like that point would relate to that point. But how does it relate? What's the common... What's the common thing between those? Sense. Yeah, that one in that case. So, what about um, that point and she's uh, point? That one. Uh, well, again, we get to the same point. But you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, if we choose that one and that one, then you get then that's the that's the common point. Yeah. What I'm saying is, it's like you know, if there's some kind of energetic reality underlying what's going on and, and energy has certain ways that it works and maybe there's some kind of branching pattern of how it's formed what is going on underneath the surface this may be something which we're tapping into with introverted intuition so um, there's two ways that's what I'm saying. Richard you have to look into um, if you don't know about yeah. it's a whole field that studies these types of relationships in okay. mathematics called space syntax Space syntax. Yeah, and it talks about connectivity and integration and everything, and, it, and cool. studies patterns like that. I did a master's in it, so I can talk to you afterwards. But it's <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yes, that's yeah. our claim. Okay. But it's you Let's might have to overlay the um, the cognitive functions onto it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I've got I've already kind of got a branching model. Hi. Um, it just looks like you've done that differentiation. And yeah. Differentiation. Absolutely. Yeah. Differentiation. And, and that's good. And, and, and the physical world differentiates because the energetic world differentiates. It's following the form of that, you know. And, and if it's, if the energetic and, and re physical reality are just flip sides of one another, but the energy is kind of driving the, the forward motion, then you'd expect that it would kind of follow. Um, so when you when you when you tap into introvert intuition, you go into the underconscious and you have this re these recollections. What's going on in that in that? matrix of, of points that you've got. So I'm thinking of two different processes in different ways that introverted intuition can do that. So let's say you focus on a single point. Um, like I said, it could be that one. Um, and then you have a glo you can have a global assessment of all its stored connections that synthesize into a gist, like a, an essence, like an overall sense of, of what is it, like a cumulative um, a cumulative quality of what all the qualities that related to it from your lifetime's experience are. Does that make sense? So I guess that diagram doesn't quite do justice, but it's more like the, let's say you've got the whole matrix that is that, but like infinitely dense of like all the connections in every possible way, in every direction, and you just focus on one point and you go, what is that? And you want to perceive what it is, and then suddenly like you, you get a flash of like, um, what do you call it? Like, like a synthesis, like an average, like a cumulative 
of all of the things that connect to it and their qualities and, and, and what the overall sense of that is. And I think we're getting close to, to kind of what we experience in introvert intuition. Um, where is the next one? Yeah. And the second thing I was thinking is, well, what happens if you start with multiple points? And that's what I was doing on here, is like, you, you want to sense a sense of common shared quality um, or essence of nature, and, and you can trace that through the branching differentiation path. That's just what I was doing on there. So for me, I'm like thinking of like, even a kind of concept term, I'm like, um, the idea of um, introverted intuition and energy and, and, uh, and memory and, and several other th points of concept and, and I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm like saying, where do they all join? What's the common, what's the common joint between all those things? Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and therefore it feels timeless. And, and what's interesting is about, about the, the world of energy is how fast does it go? How fast do fields and waves move? Speed of light. Speed of light? Who said that? There we go. Good man. Yeah, speed of light. Because light is an electromagnetic wave. Duh. Therefore, it is, you know, and, and in the energetic world, that's how fast things go. And like, how fast do we get an intuition? Yeah, exactly. I think there probably is a process behind it that you could be aware of if it was slow enough to perceive it. I think the reason you can't perceive a process it's because it's so bloody fast, it's like, it's, it's, but it's at the speed of light. Electricity, light, gravity, like, all these things propagate at the speed of light, Electro electromagnetic, like, fields and energy. Yeah, but, but Richard, when we're thinking it's like mm. the speed of light, not just in intuition, yeah. it gets like that. We don't actually, we can't feel ourselves thinking. Well, people would say not, not all the cognitive functions are at the speed of light. Some of the, like, not the other ones that aren't introverted intuition, seem to have more of a gradual process that you can be aware of what's going on. Certainly the thinking functions are, right? We can, we can sort, of sit, sort of see the cogs turning when we're thinking, but with, intu with intuition it doesn't. It's like snaps into being instantaneously. It's like the speed of it is so much quicker. You can definitely be aware of the process of the other functions. Yeah. I think that you know, in, if you really looked at the entire process, it's, it's, it can take a millennium to get to. Mm -hmm. When it snaps into yeah, place, it, it feels momentarily, you know, yeah. just it feels like that. So, you know, we can, we're smart enough to be able to trace back mm -hmm. to where were all the bits that I collected that came to that. But it's the moment when it, it yeah. snaps together that's instantaneous. Absolutely. And because I think to, to get there, you have to have built up enough of these yeah. from yeah. your experience to, to, to have the right connections that, that create that overall picture. <clears throat> and like I said, when that last straw snaps into place, it kind of suddenly all make it all connect. Um, so that's it for pretty much that. I've got, um, well, I haven't even got into archetypes. I mean, a lot of people know me from like work with like John Beebe's model and archetypes and things because John's like a, a mentor of mine as well. So, um, but personality parts, it's like it is literally a whole system of mind and psychology from the ground up, from first principles, using you know, this idea of like. Uh, I was talking about here with the energy and, and things that are actually being written about quite a lot in cognitive, um, in general consciousness, things like that. You know, because I'm taking some sort of radically modern ideas and, and sort of rebuilding an entire idea of how I see the mind and therefore personality. But it, it, it's um, it's it's going to be a, a new way to present as well to present um, John Beebe's arch function and archetype model as parts, as, as rather than a unitary personality, like different parts that actually. Can interact and have interactions between them, between within people and between people. Um, and I'm running some pilot courses. It's a whole weekend for seventy nine pounds, which is a cheap as chips, not those chips. Um, Twelfth to thirteenth of May and ninth and tenth of June in Clapham North, London. Uh, a couple of months after that, we're having a baby, so it's a good time to do it now. Um, and if you email me, so have a, have a think about that. Go and have a look at personalityparts.com, write it down. Go and have a look. Take action now. That's my sales pitch. And then email me also, richard at personalityparts.com, and interact. Chat to me about what you've learned. Tell me how much it hurt your brain, um, or what it taught you, or what you learned from it. And um, we'll, we'll just go to the bar later and have a chat. And I, if you want I, some slides, uh, like, a PDF, email me for that as well.
Whew. Really, really. Yeah. Thank you.